Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Philip. Um, I hope you enjoy the talk. Um, after the talk, if you have any questions, that's when everyone is kind of available um, to answer anything you have Monero-related or Coinbase-related or um, cryptocurrency-related, I guess, um, as well, and blockchain-related, right? They're all kind of um, related in some way. Okay, so enjoy the talk and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Look at that, computer worked. I'm gonna apologize in advance for my voice. It's, uh, it's not keeping up super well uh, this weekend. But with, uh, with, the, with the amplification, hopefully it'll, it'll go okay, and along with some water as well. Um, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Got a good group of hecklers here today. That's gonna be a good time. Um, thanks for coming out at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm sure some of you just stayed awake until 10 o'clock in the morning, so more power to you. Um, uh, you can go to bed soon. Uh, as I said, my name's Philip. Um, for the last two and a half years, I've led security at Coinbase. Um, it, I'm normally, this is the point where I ask the question, who's heard of Coinbase? But um, I'm pretty sure that's an obvious question here. Uh, how many of you guys are customers? Nice, that's a, a half-ish. Really cool, thank you. Um, so I'll skip the, the, the sort of what is Coinbase. But so the other way I describe what, I, what, what we do is we are in the world's largest CTF um, with the, with the uh, highest stakes sort of outcome. All right, so we, we store uh, somewhere on the order of 10 to $15 billion of cryptocurrency, <clears throat> which is not something that uh, anyone wants to lose, right? Um, before we get into all that stuff, um, I'll, I'll just want to talk about the elephant in the room for a second. Right? I'm the first talk of the day. Half of you are asleep, half of you are drunk from last night. Um, but so I, I appreciate you came out. And I think w w what, I, what I want to sort of give you back for your attention here is uh, a bit of insight into what it takes to protect a modern cryptocurrency exchange. Um, we'll get into why that's hard um, in, in my point of view, um, as well as some sort of viewpoints into, into where I think we as an industry need to get better. Um, and need to get better in order to push crypto, actually push crypto to the masses, not just you know a very small boardroom, a very small room in the middle of uh, of DEF CON. Right. So, um, so I've personally I've been doing this security thing for a while. Um, I, I I try to pick where I work with a very simple lens. Uh, it's just where can I find the most interesting attackers, and I, and uh, that that's led me to a bunch of different places over my career. Um, but I will say cryptocurrency uh, is I think takes the cake so far in terms of uh, interesting challenges, um, and really in terms of doing things that no one's ever done before in, in this context, which has been pretty cool. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, Coinbase is hiring. Coinbase is always hiring uh, for security specifically, um, but really across the board. If, if what I'm talking about like, is interesting to you, you want to learn more, um, come grab me, happy to chat. So bottom line, what are we going to talk about today? Number one, um, we're going to talk about a little bit the industry at large. Give some context on, on why cryptocurrency is, is actually a hard, or being an exchange is actually a pretty hard problem. Um, we're going to talk about a bit about how Coinbase looks at the problem. Um, I'm not going to go through our, Coinbase's entire security program because we'd be here way longer than an hour. Um, but I am going to hit on a few sort of areas that I think are interesting um, and how we execute security against in this environment. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the industry as a whole and, and where I think we can improve and, and do better and actually push ourselves out there and bec become the kind of industry that my mom is okay investing in. It's really my bar when I think about this stuff, is I think about my mom, right? And if she, if she, would, if she could interact with, with whatever we're building in the same way that she would interact with Citibank or Wells Fargo or, or anything else that has to do with money, then like, right direction. So, so that's a big number. That number is the, the total losses in cryptocurrency 2011 to, to 2018 across the industry. It's, it's compiled by a, a nonprofit called uh, CryptoAware. Um, they're, they're actually a really cool little, little nonprofit. They're focused on sort of user security and advocacy in cryptocurrency, right? Um, and actually, I'm, I'm, my opinion is they're underreporting that number. Um, that number doesn't generally include the sort of retail scams, social media stuff. Uh, uh, tech support scams. So that, that number is probably actually significantly larger right, than, than, than we can track in terms of exchange compromises and major scams. 
But I'll give you, I'll give you a slightly scarier number. Right? So of that almost three billion that's been lost uh, 2011, 2018, 1.7 was lost year to date in 2018. Right? That is, a ter that is the wrong slope for that curve. Right? We want that curve, that slope, the other direction. We want that going down. We want less losses over time. And so that, that begs the question, and this is really what sort of starts our approach to, to a security program Coinbase, why is this hard? What is so hard about protecting crypto? Well, see, another, another way we, we break down this industry is in terms of causes of loss. So this is a graph from um, the blockchain graveyard. If you guys are not familiar with it, it's an outstanding resource maintained by a guy named Ryan McGee and Magoo, um, who uh, he basically crawls whatever public information there is out there about uh, a breach at a given organization, um, tries to find a root cause or, or tries to sort the wheat from the chaff and puts it on his, on his GitHub repo, right? Um, and then over time he charged that. I think he's tracking He's tracking breaches from 2011 to 2018. Um, really great summary of each, of each one. Um, if, if you have, if you're interested, you have time, I highly recommend, if you're in the industry, you go read it. Because it is, it is a list of lessons learned in our industry. Or put another way, a list of things to avoid in our industry. That's, that's really, really important. Uh, sorry, what article is Blockchain grave. Just Google blockchain graveyard. It's the first result. Kind of a unique term. So, so this is total he's tracking in their 59 breaches since 2011. That's, that's an average, by the way, to save you guys math, of eight breaches a year in this space. Um, incredibly high number, higher than basically any other industry I can really think of, um, besides maybe the payment card industry, but that's a, such a huge industry that the numbers don't really quite, quite compare. So we ask the question again, what, when we ask the question again, why is this so hard? This starts to give us some answers, give us, give us some insight into how are we losing, right? And the interesting thing to me is, by and large, we are not losing because of esoteric cryptocurrency vulnerabilities as an industry. We're losing because of bread and butter, server vulns, app vulns, um, you know, not enough, not, not enough customer off. We're losing because of um, scams. We're losing because of, of security problems that we as an industry have been working on for decades at this point, right? What, what does it say down here? Protocol cold, I think there are, what is that, four breaches of the 49 that, that he can actually point at a, a protocol level vuln or, or something like really, really deep in the cryptocurrency world. Um, so the, do we go back again to, to sort of why is this so hard? If, if server breaches are, are, are the cause, like why haven't, why haven't we solved this problem yet, right? It, can anyone tell me what movie that's from? Yes, outstanding. <laughs> Give that man a cookie. Uh, which Die Hard? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Knock him up, yep. So those are, those are bearer bonds. Uh, those are $100,000 $100, bearer bonds, right? And, and what I think about sort of the, the, the security model analog for cryptocurrency, what I think of is digital bearer bonds. A lot of people say cash. Um, I, I don't like the cash analogy because if you've ever tried to move $10 million of cash, it's actually not really easy. It's very heavy and bulky and, and uh, not easy to move around. Bearer bonds are super easy, right? That stack right there is, if, if it was real, which obviously it's not, um, but, but is, is easily hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, give him something. That was awesome. I expected no one to get it. Woo, good job. Um, I may throw more of these out there now. Uh, should've gotten more screenshots. Fail, sorry. Um, so, so why is it like a bear bond? So I'll, I'll quote you from Wikipedia. Um, uh, the bear bond differs from the more common types of investment securities and in that is unregistered. The records are kept of the owner, the transactions, or ownership. Whoever physically holds the paper owns the bond. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That, that sounds a lot like cryptocurrency to me in terms of the, the, sort of the, the threat model for, for theft. So, so what we're trying to do is protect an asset that's globally valuable. A Bitcoin's a Bitcoin, no matter where you are in the world. That's digitally transferable, which is, is actually fairly unique, and is irrevocable. If we set up to design 
an asset that people would want to steal, I'm not quite sure we could have made a better one. Right? Like, I, I don't know what we'd add to that to make it more attractive to, to attackers. So that's why it's hard. Right? We're trying to do uh, and protect a new asset, a new thing. Yes. Um, I'm going to leave it to Simon at the end, if you don't mind. What a slide. So, like I said, we're protecting a, a really what, what is a new class of asset, right, that has fundamentally different risks from previous assets. Um, it's, it, it, in a really interesting way, we, we're doing that in, in, in the context of, of an online service, right? It's not like this thing is in a vault somewhere necessarily. Um, most of us in the industry who are, who are building these systems are building them in a way that you know, users are interacting with them on, on a website, on an exchange, on a wallet, on whatever, right? And because we're protecting a brand new asset class, we as an industry are sort of learning as we go to some extent here, right? What works, what doesn't work, um, and how it works, especially around sort of the, the, the areas of protecting these assets that aren't, don't quite fit the mold of anything else in, in the world. So, so we're sort of inheriting the threat model as, a, as an organization in this space of sort of part maybe social media company, part bank, and part something else that's like not yet defined, right? So we're trying to fit solutions and, and controls into a framework that is new. And, and sort of we're naturally having, having uh, uh, teething pains doing that as an industry. So no wonder this is such a hard place to exist. So great, it's hard. Shock. I'm sure all of you are shocked to find out that cryptocurrency, defending cryptocurrency is hard, right? Um, so what does it look like for us to defend this stuff, right? So, so like I said at the beginning, I'm not, I'm not gonna go over like Coinbase's entire security program. We'd be here for a week. Um, but I think there, there's some stuff to talk about that, that is interesting and unique and the, how we approach this problem. And the first thing, uh, and actually I'll, I'll talk th through a, a few of these interesting things. We, we actually open sourced a fair bit of this stuff already. Um, and the stuff that's not open source, most of it is moving that direction over the next six or nine months. I'll highlight sort of what bits are open source, what bits are coming, um, and what bits uh, you can learn more about in other talks. The other thing, one of our sort of foundational ideas here is that, is that trust should be created through transparency Right? Not, through, not through blind faith. Right? So if I'm asking you, hey, you trust me with your money, I should be backing that up with a, and here's why. Right? And here's what we're gonna do to protect it and make it safe and keep it safe. So we spend a lot of time talking at, at conferences and events um, about sort of the tools, the techniques, about what and why and how and where we do it. Right? Um, and and our, our attempt is to continue and, even, and do, it, do it even more. So the first and most important thing to, to think about when you think about Coinbase's security program um, is, is the people, right? So today Coinbase is, eh, call it 500 people. Um, security at Coinbase is 30 people. That's 6% of the company is focused on security, which is an insane ratio for most organizations, most, most industries, right? And I think the, especially when we're talking about an asset like cryptocurrency, right, where um, it, we, there is a ton of innovation. We build a lot of our own tools. Um, we're really forward looking. You have to start with the people because they're the ones that are going to innovate, that are going to find the new ways of thinking about securing this stuff, um, that, are, that are going to actually be the ones solving the problems. You, I can't look at a vendor for this. There, there are no vendors that look at protect, well, there are probably some. But there are no vendors that say, you know what, I'm gonna protect your cryptocurrency and you put it here and we're gonna make it, make it safe and make it easy. So it goes back to the people. And I'll say, I'll just say once again, toss it out there, we're hiring. Just saying. Some people over there you can talk to if, if that's interesting. So this is a pretty picture of what we're not actually gonna talk about. Um, but it's very pretty. <laughs> Uh, this, it's, it's a high-level architecture of Coinbase, very, very high-level. Um, so high-level that's not actually useful, but it's pretty, which is why I have it. Um, so, so if we go back to that, that 
blockchain graveyard slide for a second. Number one leading cause of these tracked breaches is, is or these tracked sort of losses is server breach, right? So when we think about our security program, we walk through why is this hard? Um, one of the answers is, you know what, attackers are, are walking through the front door. So let's talk a little bit about how we, how we close and lock the front door in, in this kind of environment. Um, we got, Coinbase and cryptocurrency in general, I think we're actually super lucky because we don't have legacy to deal with for the most part, right? We get to build this stuff from, from the ground up um, and we get to build it and I'll, I see this as lucky, others will disagree. We get to build it under constant pressure from attackers, right? Um, my philosophy, and this is one of the reasons that when I, when I look for places to go, I look for places that are great attackers, no one teaches you like an attacker. Right? You, you, you never innovate as well as you do when you have a clear and present threat or danger to innovate against. Right? It motivates you, it focuses you, it, makes you, it helps you do your best. Right? So we get to build this ground up, new technology, under pressure, under focused attack. Right? What better place could we go to build something? Other people look at this and say, like, wow, it's super stressful. And it is, right? but it's also amazing. Um, so, so, so what have we built here? So Coinbase is a fully containerized, every single service in Coinbase is deployed in a container. Um, virtualized, we're in AWS. Continually and immutably deployed service. Right, so let me break that down for, for a little bit. First of all, um, this is all based on a custom orchestrator we built internally called CodeFlow, which are open sourcing piece by piece. Um, we, we open sourced our, the actual deployer itself called Odin, uh, I don't know, three months ago. Um, it's a thing that takes a, a description of a deployment, it's a JSON file, and actually makes it happen in AWS. Um, and we're, we're, uh, it's a, it's a, like the rest of Coinbase, it's a service-oriented architecture, so we're open sourcing piece by piece of CodeFlow um, you know, as we, quite honestly, as the development teams are happy with, with it and want to want to actually get it out in the world. So CodeFlow handles code from, from PR to deploy and prod, right? It handles the entire path um, and manages everything from um, consensus requirements on uh, code submission, which we'll talk about more in depth, to security scanning, to CICD, to build, to um, consensus on, uh, or to, to secrets management, to deployment. It's all in sort of one, one long CICD path. Um, what, that, what that means is that we, make, we can make a lot of this stuff transparent to our developers, and build a really overall very, very safe and secure uh, CICD pipeline, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit deeper uh, a little bit later. So, so let's dive into that, the, the rest of that. So containerized, right? Like I said, every single service in Coinbase is in a container. Some of you were probably shuddering when I said containers because you have some sort of container fear. Um, containers can be the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the world when it comes to sort of software management and deployment. Um, it can be the worst thing in the world when you back into it, right? As you discover six months after the fact that your dev team is using containers. Um, it can be the best thing in the world if you walk into it eyes wide open and say, you know what, we're gonna be able to use containers um, but you know what, we're gonna make it easy for you guys to use containers, we're gonna manage a bunch of it for you. So at Coinbase, um, the infrastructure team manages a base container that all containers in Coinbase must descend from. We're not pulling stuff off of Docker Hub, it just won't work in our environment. Developers, development teams, then base their services from that set of base containers so that we control the underlying layers, we control the patching, we control um, what tools are installed, whole nine yards, right? Um, the developers are defining service-specific Docker files. Those, those, uh, as those of you who have some container exposure know, um, you can do a lot of damage in a Docker file. Uh, as uh, if you, if you, you know, the, the most the most obvious and consistent example is, uh, you know, a, a beautiful base layer that then has like a curl OpenSSL point, you know, 0 0.9 directly on the file systems library. Right? That's not great, um, and it's very very difficult. To, to detect that in, in a lot of cases. So what do we do? We actually run our Docker files through a linter um, and say, hey, development team, you, you can't actually do that. You can't use run and wget in the same line. We're not gonna let you do that, right? 
right? We're not gonna let you shoot yourself in the foot. But instead, here, go, th go through this paved road, this other way of doing this. We'll get you the packages you need that are up to date that we can track and update and, and make better, right? Um, and, and that not only takes load off of our developers, but it means that we control our environment in a way that's really hard to do outside of that kind of setup. We control every single package, every deployment, every line of code, every version. Um, we know where it is, when it rolled out, where it rolled out, how it rolled out, right? That's awesome from my perspective. So you might ask, okay, containerized and virtualized, like what? What? Right? Why, why, why do you both? What's going on? Um, so there's, there's, sounds like a train is right on outside here. Um, so there's two reasons for that. Um, one is we, when we think through sort of the threat model on cryptocurrencies, um, one of the things you quickly come up with with this, again, this digitally transferable, non-revocable, globally valuable currency, is that this is one of the relatively few, in my opinion, industries where dropping and burning an O-Day actually might make sense, right? Most of the time, it's probably economically doesn't work out in terms of like risk of, risk of loss versus risk of gain. Um, here it might. So, so one of the foundational things we, we, we looked at is um, we, sh we should always, this is, this is a, sort of a, a common platitude, right? We should always layer our security. So how we do this is we, when we, this is also one of the reasons we built Codeflow because nothing else could do this. When we deploy, right, we group containers on, on verts that are mutually trusting, right? Where if you popped one, you're probably gonna get to those anyway because there are credentials sitting in, you know, sitting on that, that one or, or otherwise um, it's highly likely you're gonna be able to pivot. We then ensure that containers that don't have a, a mutual trust relationship never exist on the same virtual machine, right? So that means um, in order to hop from a front-end web service to a back-end payment service, right? You're not gonna do that through a side channel on the vert or through popping the, you know, uh, uh, an O'Day Privesk in the Linux kernel. You're actually gonna have to do the hard work of moving through my environment and pivoting where I can see you, right? Not trying to do it in memory on a, on a Linux system. Right? The, other, the other way I, I think about, and we think about defense a lot, is, um, you know, there, there's the common uh, defenders have to always be right, attackers have to you know, be right once, which is, which is true to, to, to as far as it goes. The other way of thinking that about this, this sort of setup is that attackers have to play on my playground. They have to come to me and exist in my environment. So then my mission then is to make my environment as inhospitable as possible to anyone who's gonna come and try to take my crypto. Right. And if I, if I do my job well, I can, I can make that actually quite frustrating. Um, let's see. So, oh, that was the wrong thing. So, at, at, then at the end, let's talk about that, that continuously deployed immutable bit. Right. So, we deploy, um, on average, there's, we've published some blog posts about this, so you can go actually look at the data, something like 20 times a day. We deploy a lot. Every time we deploy, we are rebuilding that service from the ground up with no overlap. New verts, new containers, new security group, new ASG, whole nine yards. There's not even any network connectivity between the, the, the two uh, services. Um, if we're deploying 20 times a day with that kind of, of rebuild sort of structure built in, um, that means on average, I, th I think our average lifetime is something like 1.5 hours for a service running in prod, right? That's a fairly frustrating environment for an attacker to live in. Um, and really what it does, um, and this is why I particularly like it, is it makes the attacker re-exploit every single time, right? Exploits are inherently unstable, especially remote exploits you're trying to land on some random AWS virtual machine in the cloud. Um, you're not, maybe not sure what actual operating system is underneath there. Um, you're gonna crash stuff if you're re-exploiting at that frequency. And when you crash stuff, even if you're, the rest of your exploit was completely stealth, I'm gonna know, because it's gonna, it's gonna crash, right? And we track that. So then I can come back and figure out what crashed, why, what's going on, right, and respond. This goes back to, as an attacker has to live in my playground, that means I get to set the rules. Let's talk about AppSec for a second. Um, we do a bunch uh, this is one I think of the focuses in our program. Again, walking back to this fun graph. 
right? So right after server breach, ignoring unknown, because unknown is unknown, we have application vulnerability, right? So we spend a lot of effort on making sure that this, the systems and services we deploy um, are, are safe, are defensible, are tested, are documented, are threat modeled, um, and, that, and that fundamentally we understand what we are running, um, not just so that we can defend it, but so that we can uh, act to prevent anything from happening in the organization. So, so one of the things, I'll, I'll, I'll walk down this, this uh, overall thing. The, the first one I'll start with is, is, is Salus. So this is on track to open source, um, I, would, I would guess before the end of the year. Um, so Salus is our, is our stack analysis framework, right? So, so what, what we did early on was, was looking around, we, we had the realization of course that hey, you know what, um, if, if setting aside the server breach thing, right, attackers are to come in through the app, by and large. Right? So how do we make sure that as we're shipping, and we're shipping very fast, right, 20 times a day, as we're shipping these updates, how do we make sure it's safe? Right? So the, the, uh, one of the answers to that is through automated analysis of uh, code before it hits prod, in a way that um, gives engineers immediate feedback as to like why, if, if assuming we flag something, why we flagged it, what's wrong with it, what they can do to fix it, and hopefully not do it again, and in a way that aggregates those stats over our entire base of developers so that we can look for hotspots, we can look for issues, we can look for teams that need a little bit more uh, engagement, right? So that's Salus. What's Salus? Now, uh, one method we could have done here is let's build a static, a static analyzer, right? Um, but that doesn't make sense to me because there are a lot of great stack analyz analyzers out there already. What, what's missing is the ability to point them at what they're, at what they're best at and normalize their results in a way that we can then use downstream to say, hey, the, here, the problem exists here, this is, this, is, this is what the problem is. So that's what Salus is. Salus is essentially a framework for interacting with static analysis tools that can uh, pick and route based on the language it detects for a given project, um, pick the analyzers that are relevant for that language in that project, take the results back in whatever format we get from the random analysis framework we, we, we chose to use for that language or that problem, put it into a common format across the board, and then use that to interact with the original pull request and say, hey, line 15, this trip to this rule from this, this analyzer, hey developer, please please resolve this before you're allowed to deploy. And then Salus will say, and by the way, you can't merge this change until this is resolved. Right? No humans, no humans in the loop, no human interaction, but our development teams get security scanning, they get instant feedback. They get feedback in line in a way they would have gotten it for, in a code review. Um, and we protect Coinbase itself from whatever that, that change may have been. Um, it's a really, really cool little tool. I'm, 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 I'll be really happy when we get it out, out in the world. The second thing we focused on, again, was this, was this idea of sort of the, the, the CI/CD pipeline, right? And if we're integrating security into an organization that's moving as fast as Coinbase, we have to be um, as close to zero touch as we can possibly be, right? So, so this, this mirrors a little bit of what I talked about for the infrastructure side of things, right? About that. Um, we, we want to integrate with development, development practices seamlessly, right? We want to be there as part of the, the, the CI pipeline. We want developers to find it easy to write security unit tests, right? Part of, part of following up on, a, on, on any incident is how do we make sure this doesn't happen again, right? So we want to be there to help them say, you know what, let's put in a security unit test in this, in this CI pipeline. We want that, that deployment pipeline to be um, easy and straightforward and have developers not have to worry about managing their systems because we can manage that for them, right? Consensus requirements on code merge. This is actually, I think, a, a pretty nifty thing that we do. So to, to push any code change out in Coinbase requires sign-off from multiple engineers, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you want to push a change to, to, to Coinbase, um, you're going to have to do, you with yourself as your submitter are going to have to go get call it three other people to say, you know what, this is a good idea. Those three people can't have, can't have um, added code to, to the actual PR question. It has to be two, three totally independent people. Um, 
as you do that, that plus one, it's just a, a plus one in, in line in the pull request. It's two-factor authed, right? So you get that, that nice push to your phone that says, hey, you just said that we should deploy from service X, commit hash Y. Was, was that you? Did you mean to do that? Right? And assuming the answer is yes, then great. Everything merges, it gets, all gets deployed. Assuming the answer is no, um, that kicks off a, a sort of a minus one process, right? Where we can actually say, you know what, you, you actually need more eyes on this. This three, like this is this is super terrible. You, sh you should have require four or five or six reviewers, depending on how many minuses the, the pull request is getting. All right, this lets us um, ensure that no one individual this is another sort of core concept we shoot for. No one individual, no single person can make, can do a thing that impacts Coinbase or uh, uh, are the, the, the PII, the fiat or the cryptocurrency that we have, we have stored. It should always require a conspiracy because conspiracies are fragile and they're scary and they're really high risk for the conspirator. And we wanna, again, the attacker in this case has to play on our playground. We wanna make that playground rule as hard as possible for that attacker. Concierge AppSec program. So, so this is one of the this is one of the reasons the AppSec team is probably my biggest team at Coinbase is because we want AppSec not not to be the guys that sort of parachute at the end and say no everything's terrible, like go home. This is this is crap. You can't deploy it. Um, that's not productive for anybody. Um, instead, we want our AppSec team to be in the standups of these development teams to be in, to be embedded at the hip to have all the same incentives to, to get what they're trying to do so that as, as that team is writing code, is, is making changes, that AppSec team member knows exactly what's going on across the board and can render sort of that independent third party, oh, hey, that's actually pretty risky. You, you may not have known. Like, let's, let's, let's engage and let's help out and let's, let's make this change. Again, the, this, this is the, the sort of the, the app level vuln and it, for an exchange especially is, is one of the most worrying things that we deal with. We want to make sure that we're providing that expertise and we're providing it in a way that developers want to use it, right? That want to get engaged. The last thing I'll, I'll highlight here that, that I think is quite cool um, is uh, that, that we're getting much, much more into recently is blockchain monitoring, right? So if you imagine a world where um, there's, uh, 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 you don't have to imagine it, it's today. What are there? 1,800 or so assets, somewhere in that, in that, in that vein, in that vicinity. Um, 1,800 or so crypto assets in, uh, in the world today. Um, as, as we think about you know, looking at, at assets to add, you guys saw we just added ETC. Um, we've talked very publicly about, about the desire to add more. One of the things we, we want to be sure of is as we add those assets, that we're proactively looking at those blockchains to say, is this asset still safe? Right. Do we know what's going on in this asset? Is there a 51 percent attack happening? Is there, you know, uh, is there a contract invocation of a, of a function in a token that should never be in, that, that should never be invoked, um, so that we can take immediate protective action, right, on our systems, so that we're protecting to the extent we can with, with whatever the vulnerability is, our our assets or our customers' assets more more appropriately. Right? Um, this is also an area that we're pushing pretty hard in, um, and that I, I hope we'll open we'll open source some tools in um, as we as we get that stuff uh, built built and rolled out. Because, like I said, at the end of the day, what trust should be based on transparency. You guys shouldn't have to wonder how I'm protecting your crypto. You should know. Let's talk about the texture spots, right? Um, because at the end of the day, you can't win them. Um, you need to have the ability to detect when things go wrong, and you need to have the ability to respond safely, right? So, so that goes to the heart of this first one. Um, this is my, my, the, my favorite name of all of our projects, Dexter. He was our, he's our friendly forensics assistant. A few Dexter fans in the audience I can see, outstanding. The rest of you can Google it later and, and you'll laugh when you do it. <laughs> um, so so uh, what's, what's Dexter, why do we build it? So you go back to what I said earlier, right? No one person should have the ability to impact or, st or, or steal you know, Coinbase, crypto, PII, fiat, et cetera. But when you think about incident response, that's one of those areas where the response is frequently, oh, we'll just throw all that shit out the window and we'll just go ahead and respond as an individual. 
right? That, that to us is, is extremely dangerous and, and worrying. We don't want that, right? But at the same time, we want to be able to respond to incidents quickly um, and uh, uh, very, very, sort of very, very agilely. So how do we, how do we square that circle? What, what Dexter does is, is two core things. Number one, it provides uh, a consensus-based approach to executing forensic commands. Right? So something happens, some instance is doing a weird thing in, in production, um, and maybe it's an instance that's actually you know, dealing with, dealing with, with crypto. Right? I don't want an instant responder hopping on there. Um, but the incident responder can spin up Dexter, start an investigation, and say, this is weird, give me a process listing, uh, give me you know, basic live response, processes, LSOF, um, maybe some stuff from PROC, depending on what the actual problem was. And that investigation spins up, and then sits there, and waits for a plus one from another incident response engineer. Depending on the commands you're executing via Dexter, the number of required reviewers changes. Right, so maybe process listing LSOF, not a big deal, it's just a plus one. Um, maybe he then says, you know what, I, I actually need a memory dump because um, I don't know what's going on here and I need to really get deep into this. That's going to require a lot more consensus. Right? Maybe it requires a plus two, plus three. Maybe it requires sign off from me. Or maybe it requires sign off from legal. Right? Um, but it lets us very flexibly define who and how can execute sensitive commands even in a fast-moving, highly critical incident response situation, right? We never want to be back to that place where one person can do a thing. Um, it's also built to be sort of, um, there's a bunch of other cool things about it uh, around, uh, in our in our environment, it's it's highly segmented, right? So, so hosts normally can't talk to each other. There's, there's no place on our network where you can go talk to everybody to do incident response, right? So it's S3-based, so we're, we're, pull, we're pushing into a queue the hosts are monitoring, they're pulling down and saying, oh, is this for me, is this for me? Yes, no, maybe. It's all backed by DPG signatures, right? So we're actually basing the stuff in crypto, not on like a software counter that says, oh yeah, you plus one me enough, I'm good to go. Um, this, is, this is actually, so the guy who wrote this is open sourcing it at DerbyCon this year. Just got his talk accepted, I don't know, two, weeks, two, two three weeks ago. Um, if you're at DerbyCon, you should really go to the talk because um, it'll be awesome. So the second thing I'll talk about here is, is again, another, another uh, derivation of that, of that container, container-based stuff. So I, I, I do a, another talk, which you can go find from ShakaCon, I think was the last place I did it, um, that's uh, incident response and Dockerized and containerized environments, where I, where I talk through sort of um, the, what's unique and special about, about containerization when it comes to incident response and detection. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a really cool, interesting environment. Um, but the thing I'll highlight here is that because we've Dockerized everything, everything's in a Docker container, everything is running isolated, that means we can very easily pull specific behavioral information about a given service, right? So the reason that, that this stuff doesn't, doesn't work well across the board normally is because there are just so many signals to deal with, right? There's system level signals, there's, if you try to do this on laptops, God help you, um, because that's even, that's even worse. But even on server environment, right, it's really, really hard. In our environment, we can constrain it down to a Docker container and say, how is this Docker container behaving? How is this single process acting? And is it acting different than its peers, right? Um, and then based on that, we can, we can do things like, you know, using core basic tools, audit D, eBPF, look at that and say, how is this acting at a system level different than its peers? Right. Is, this, is this behaving in a way that's indicative of, of an attacker being on this environment? And if so, we go back to Dexter and we can actually respond very, very flexibly to that, to that area, figure out what's going on, and, and sort of uh, uh, figure out what we need to do next. The last thing I'll talk about um, that, we, that we do that, that's, that's cool and special is we log everything. When I say everything, I mean everything. Um, we do this for a couple of reasons. Number one, we go back to that deployment cycle. We're, depl we're deploying 20 times a day, average lifetime is like one and a half hours. Um, what happens if there was an incident and we discover eight hours later, right? The container's gone, what are we gonna do with it? Right, so the answer to that is we log and, and in much, most importantly, enrich everything immediately, right? So when that container's gone, I can still walk back and pull, those, pull all the logs that were issued by that container, tagged with that container's name and version number, tagged with 
you know, the, the, the processes, the result process names, whole nine yards. Most of the stuff I would get from a live, from a live response, I can regenerate from logs that we maintain of these, of these instances. And I can, get the, I can get it quickly, I can get it searchably, right? The most important thing, I think the most important and different thing we do here is metadata, metadata, just all the metadata. Anything that might possibly be useful in the future, we'll tack on a log, right? Uptime, we tack on the logs. Um, so that as we roll into this, um, uh, into any future investigation, there's never any, uh, to the extent we can, any ambiguity. There's never any question that we have the data we need to make a determination as to what happened. So we got about, I don't know, seven or so minutes left before I'll open it up for questions. Before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about sort of what we can do better as a, as a community. I think there's, there's, three, there's three specific points I wanna, I wanna drive home, right? One is today, did I just, there we go. There's not enough threat intelligence sharing in the crypto community. There just isn't. Um, we, we're, we're fragmented ideologically, we're fragmented commercially, and we do not talk to each other enough, even though we share the same opponents. The same attacker coming after me, it's coming after Gemini, it's coming after Anybody else here who's running, who's running an exchange or a currency? We share opponents, right? Why wouldn't we share threat intelligence about those opponents to make us all stronger? So to, to one concrete thing here, I'll, I'll just, I'll flag really quick is, um, we recently, in working with um, some other exchanges and some other traditional financial folks, started an, an FSI SAC working group. If you don't know what FSI SAC is, right? It's Financial Services Information, Information Sharing Analysis Center. Um, it's been sort of a cornerstone of what traditional finance, how traditional finance has done this for decades, right? This is sort of a, a nonpartisan, not owned by any one company, a way to interact and share with peer organizations. So we started this, this working group, um, and we're, we're reaching out now to, to anyone and everybody who, uh, who is involved in the crypto space to say, come, join, help us establish this sort of basic level of security trust and cooperation so that we can all get better. Right. Number two, um, and this is actually also related to FSI SAC, we're, we're not really good at you know, standards as a community. There are a few out there, right? Um, the CCSS is, is one that's, that's been out for a while and gotten some traction. But when you go back and, and you look at um, sort, of, sort of how Traditional finance evolved over time. I'll, 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 I'll give an analogy that, that I like. I'll see if you guys like it too. Um, if, if you were in the 1800s, 1850s, right, walking around looking for a bank to deposit your money, you're walking to the town, walking to the bank. This, you know, this is nice. This, this is a place. This is great. One of the questions you're probably going to ask is, "Tell me about your vault, right? How do you how are you going to secure my money?" Because bank robbery was was much more common. There are a lot more risks. Everything was more fragmented. And as an informed consumer, you needed to ask that. Today, let me ask, let me just poll the room. Has anyone ever walked into a bank and said, before I deposit my money, I need to see your vault? Has anyone, anyone ever asked that? No. You know why? Because uh, that industry grew up. It built standards. It built, uh, uh, and through those standards, it built trust with people, right? It's a more complicated story. There's insurance involved. There's regulation, right? I'm simplifying it. But through the use of standards, we can build trust, trust with customers, trust with regulators, right? So that the question shifts from, from where it is today for crypto. I'm gonna deposit my crypto, tell me about your security. To where it needs to be, tell me about your services. Tell me about how you deliver better service than whoever else. Tell me about why I should put my money here because I'm gonna get these other benefits, right? So then the ask is, either in the, under the auspices of the FSI SAC working group or, or, or uh, uh, via an organization like the CCSS or whatever, we as an industry need to invest in standards. We need to invest in not just creating standards but coming together around standards to driving ourselves as a community, holding ourselves to that standard so that we can be worthy of that trust. Last. And this is obviously a self-interested point. Um, really not enough folks in the security community are looking at crypto and saying like, you know what, that's a great place to do security. 
right? Uh, you know, we, we see some of it. It's starting to change. Uh, certainly over the past year, I've seen a, I've seen a change. But, but I don't think we as a community are, do, are doing enough to talk to the rest of the security community, not just about how cool crypto is, because it is really cool, and that's, but about how, what an interesting problem set this is, right? How, how interesting is it to secure a thing that's never been secured before? To write the book on protecting an asset in this adversarial environment, right? People should be knocking down the doors of cryptocurrency companies to say, wow, that's a, that's a great challenge. Like, why wouldn't I want to engage there? And I think they're not because we as a community, again, we're not doing the outreach. We're not talking to the rest of the community about the interesting security implications of this space. We're talking about how cool crypto is. Right. This is also a pitch to say, if you want to work for Coinbase, come talk to me, but you know. <laughs> and with that, what are your questions? I'll, I'll, I'll let you pick who, who gets first. So, uh, going back to your, um, your comparison to your bear bonds, mm -hmm. um, I'm supposing that you are making that comparison because anyone who has access to a private key can immediately gain access to the funds. Mm -hmm. So, the question is, how does that differ from uh, possession of just a password to a bank account? Because there are other controls there, right? There, the, you, so a bank would have the ability to do fraud detection on transactions. The bank would have the ability to do locate geo determination. You're in, you're in the U.S. and there's a login from Ukraine. Like maybe we should do something about that, right? There, there, there are other steps you can take in the middle there, as opposed to possession of a private key, possession of a bear bond. That's it. Game over. Done. But it's like a debit card, for example. Anyone who extracts the money can just run away with it. Sure, but depending on how they do it and where they do it, right? Um, there, it's if you have a debit card, that debit card is connected to a bank account, and there are controls on the interaction between that debit card and that bank account. You can't. The debit card doesn't necessarily mean I get all the money in the bank account, right? The, because there is a control environment between the two. There are daily limits. There's the ability of the bank to say this is a odd transaction. I'm going to freeze this debit card, right? There, the the core of the comparison, I think, is once you have a bear bond, once you have a private key. There is nothing anyone else can do to limit or protect from the loss of that, that value. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I have a couple of questions about custody. Mm -hmm. um, to have a, like a compliant custody solution, number one, is it necessary to provision identity over the account so that you know exactly who they are? Um, secondly, for custody, is, is, is centralization essential to secure custody? And thirdly, when it comes to the regulatory regimes that make the, I guess, create the most work for you, I mean, is it going to be the OCC or is it going to be the NYDFS? Like, where does most of your, as far as complying with regulations, who's, who's the toughest regulator for mm -hmm. you? So the first question um, is, is really a question about sort of BSA, right, and, and AML practices. Um, and, and in general, yes, you, we, have, we have to, for US consumers, we have to walk through BSA requirements. We, we have to do KYC on customers before, before we're, we're dealing with, with their assets. For the second question um, on, what was it, centralization on security? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I don't necessarily, it's a hard question to answer in general in the abstract, right, because it's, Security is, is, can be defined relatively, right? So uh, certainly an individual can, can invest in a level of security that's, that's good for their needs and their threat model without ever having to put assets anywhere, right? Um, and a lot of folks do, especially in the crypto land. I think the, the other side of that coin is people choose to use a centralized service because we can invest in centralized security um, or they don't want to spend the time and effort to, to build what to them is an acceptable sort of security arrangement for their crypto. So, for example, like Coinbase, is your, your, your custody solution is central, correct? Yeah. 
I mean, it, we're a centralized service in a. Right, right. And then the third one about about regulators, you know, I really I, I see this space as um, the regulation is evolving and and working with regulators, especially coming from a company like like Coinbase, who has always been very sort of regulation forward. Um, it's uh, what what we always want to do is is work with them and educate them around how this space should be regulated. Um, in our opinions, I, I think you know calling calling out any one regulator as hard, um, besides being unwise, just generally, um, <laughs> also doesn't doesn't make sense to me because all the regulators I've worked with um, have come to the table with with an open mind about, about crypto and wanting not just to make us go through a check the box exercise, but actually wanting to go back and forth about, about a new asset and, and how the old framework should apply to this new kind of asset. Yeah. Well, I just, I've just read that the NYDFS, particularly the cybersecurity rule and the new AML transaction monitoring and filtering mm -hmm. rule, that that's becoming I think you know to the extent that that it impacts everyone else. Obviously, it impacts us because we're we're operating like a financial institution. Uh, you talked about the NIST. Yeah, yeah, I think it works. Yeah, you talked about the NIST model security and detection. Like you mentioned, containerized. Mm -hmm. um, Networks versus what segment of networks? Segment. Um, so the difference is in is in the the layer of granularity, right? So so containerized workloads, your your the security boundary is is at the sort of the process the workload layer, as opposed to network segmentation, right? Where you're segmenting um, at the at the server or at the host group of hosts layer. Like the the layer of the level of visibility is different, um, as well as you know your the actions you can take are different. So it's it's to me I, I I personally prefer the segmentation on both, um, and, but if I had to pick one, I would pick host because you get a much richer data set out of a host-based detection than you get out of a network-based detection. No, we pretty much all just yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so, so user trade data is actually one of the most important things that we that we look at. We think, um, you know, the 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 last thing we want to do is uh, expose user trading activities, um, both in terms of individuals. We don't we take individual privacy extremely seriously in that sense, um, as well as like folks that are active traders with specific strategies they're executing. Um, the, the last thing we want to do is be in a position where we're leaking data on those strategies in a way that could be taken advantage of by, by others. So we did, <clears throat> thinking about, sorry, thinking about that environment a little bit, um, <clears throat> control of any sensitive data like that is really predicated on making sure you know who is accessing it, for what reason, when, and why, um, and having the ability to flag deviations from, from any sort of normal patterns there, which is at a high level the approach we take, right? With very restricted access, lots of monitoring on interactions with, that, with those kinds of data sources, um, and sort of active oversight by the security team on that kind of uh, activity. High level. Uh, sorry, I'll just, I'll just start calling people now since we have no longer mics. You and then the gentleman in front of you. Yeah, so, so we do use dedicated instances in areas where we think the workload security or the workload sensitivity uh, merits it. Um, the, the, the second piece there, um, and I've had discussions with folks about this in, in, in both directions, but because we, we move so rapidly in, in the environment, it's a, sort of a, a side effect of our deployment strategy. Um, it, it's actually fairly hard to um, end up on a host with one of our systems re reliably, right? So, like, the setup for that attack is, is pretty significant. The gentleman in the white shirt and then, and then black. Someone talked about 
someone talked about uh, custody and regulation earlier, and one thing I wanted to ask you is that many centralized exchanges have, are in the process or have launched uh, zero X like exchanges, like with on chain custody. Mm -hmm. What's your, what's the house you? Yeah, so we, we acquired a company called Paradex, what was it, three years, month, months ago, um, that's operating as, uh, operating as a zero X based relay, right? So, yeah. yeah. And from a regulatory standpoint, do you have any remark on that or not really? Um, I'll say that, that it's, it's coming back outside of the US first. Yep, gentlemen here. Um, my question is, have you considered uh, taking advantage of some of the multi-signature features in the various blockchains? Um, and is there a way to uh, look at the enhancer security overall by um, sharing some of those codes with the actual customer? Yeah, so that, that's an interesting um, question. We actually offered a multi-sig wallet for a long time. Um, had an extremely low uptake rate uh, from, from customers, right? Uh, so low that that it was um, when we when we did the the evaluation on should be should we keep this feature or not um, the the code we could simplify by taking it out was was you know a, a better trade off than than keeping a feature that almost nobody used right um, so I think if the customer demand is there sure but we just don't see it. Hi, thanks for coming and giving the talk. Um, what do you think, uh, what, what needs to be done for Coinbase to be able to accept Monero uh, and other similar strong privacy coins that are out there? Fair enough. Uh, I actually am surprised that question took that long. Uh, look, I, I think we've seen some really promising uh, moves from regulators and from the privacy coin space. Jim and I in particular has made great progress with, with Zcash. Um, and, and getting regulators comfortable with privacy coins. I think for, for us, right, there's the, the, the primary thing that we want is to make sure that customers on our platforms are getting access to the assets that, that they want and that, and that they want to use. So I think that we, we look at this primarily in terms of, um, A, in terms of our, our digital asset framework that we've published and said, hey, here's how we look at digital assets, but also in terms of what's actually gonna be most useful for our customers and what, what do they want the most? Right. And then we figure out, take a look at like, how can we do that? Yes? Uh, yeah, just a follow-up comment on that. The reason that the diehard bonds were valuable was that they're fungible. Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, I had a question on your, on your pretty slide, uh, it, which makes it look like the, um, the, like the hot wallets, you guys named that cl cluster Knox. Mm -hmm. Is that actually true? It seems a bit obvious. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> is, that, is that a comment on our poor naming schema or? <laughs> we like easy, we like simple names, short names. Dexter, Knox. In the corner there, I think. Um, so you, oh, one of the things you talked about was um, the, the various op things that you've built internally and are now in the process of open sourcing. So sort of in the build versus buy open source world, um, it seems like the period immediately after open sourcing an internal product is sort of the most dangerous period. Like you don't have, you've yet to get people fixing things externally, but um, you know, it, the, the code's out there now. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to defend um, yourselves from sort of the, the potential zero days in your own software kind of a, a scenario? Yeah. Um, your own internal vulnerability scanning for those types of systems. Yeah, um, that's one of those very broad questions that we could be here a week to answer, but <laughs> um, we don't treat internal software any different than external software in terms of our, our overall AppSec program, right? So, so code flow is going through the same, which, which is the, an example I use, is going through the same scanning tools, the same AppSec process, the same, the same testing, the same everything as a public facing service that, that's, that's part of our, our, our overall Coinbase services. Um, probably the, the, the second part of your question is interesting, is like the risk trade-off between exposing source code and, and not exposing source code. Uh, I think it's a really interesting and, and sort of I think nuanced, nuanced trade-off to make between um, the sort of principle that like trust, trust should be transparent uh, 
and and risks we have around um, you know, releasing code that might have issues in it. Uh, we we in particular when we open source components like like Odin, which we did several months ago, um, we we spend a lot of time and effort looking at that before the release. We tend to release small pieces of code um, as opposed to like here's a hundred thousand line behemoth. We want to release here's a five thousand line tool, right? Because we can much we can we can we can with that much more effectively in terms of AppSec. Yeah, as a comment, basically, I'm mostly thinking of uh, Dexter. Yeah. Just, you know, being able to so, connect to anything. it can connect to S3, and then the endpoints pull S3 for information, right? So it's not, it, it can't connect to anything. It could just talk to an S3 bucket. I think we... We might have time for one more question if there's, there's another one. There's a more. bit more time if you have time yourself. Um, we have nothing scheduled for 11 o'clock, so if you want to ask I'm not going to stay up here for an hour, just to yeah, be yeah, clear. Yeah, totally. But <laughs> if you want to do a couple more, that's okay. There seems to be a lot, but if you don't, that's fine too. Okay, so. I'll, I'll do a couple more and then, and then, and then get out of here. Uh, you mentioned uh, intelligence sharing mm -hmm. and FSISAC as a working group. I'm curious about like, how valuable that data is for you as like, probably your tech stack is completely different from uh, Wells Fargo. Sure, um, and, and that's why I think this is, so there, there's two pieces, right? One is the financial actor sharing, and one is like sharing within crypto. So two answers to that question. One is yes, my tech stack is probably totally different. Attacker behavior is probably not that different, right? How they, uh, the kinds of things that they target, how they move internally, how they act, things like that. That's what I, I don't really care about IPs and hashes, right? That's, that's good, but it's not what, what I really want. What I really want is, are attacker behaviors. Because that then feeds into my roadmap, right? Attackers want to do this. How can I make that hard, frustrating, annoying, prone to failure? Yep. There's nothing else. I'm going to call it. Done.